Good morning. The scripture for this morning is from Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life, and then you will know that I am the Lord." So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath. From the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, This is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. And then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. Let's pray. Holy God, we thank you for this day, for this morning, and I thank you for all who are worshiping with us in person or online. And Lord, I pray that your spirit will guide my words and that each person here, each person who who watches this sermon, even in the future, will walk away with what you want them to know. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I don't like bones that much. I never really have. I prefer to buy my meat deboned. Um, I'm not crazy about things with skeletons on it. I mean, there's a lot of times there's jewelry and clothing with skulls. I really, really have never liked that. Even in seventh grade uh, life science class, Um, there's a skeleton that used to hang on a pole and I would walk way around that to get to my desk. I just have never really liked bones. There's something about them. They, They represent the last traces of the dead and yet there's no real sign of the people that once had those bones. They're simply bones. They're impersonal just kind of sad. And in today's scripture, there's a lot of talk about bones. We find the prophet Ezekiel in a vision, and he's standing in a valley filled with hundreds, if not thousands, of bones. And the bones were probably the remains of a conquered army that had just been left for dead, Um, No one came to properly bury them. And so these were very old bones. Many years have passed. There's no sign of the people who once had those bones. The flesh had decomposed and dried up. And all that's left are these piles of bones. Now, I want us to take a moment and talk a little bit about Ezekiel. Because this is a book um, that we don't often read from. We aren't very familiar with the prophet Ezekiel. And and Ezekiel was an Old Testament prophet, and we can find his book kind of in the back of the Old Testament behind um, Isaiah 
in Jeremiah. He prophesied to the people of God in Babylon. Now, why was he in Babylon? I think it's important to talk about this for just a moment, a little bit of context. If you recall, God's people were initially one kingdom. They had a series of kings, names that are very familiar to us. Saul, David, Solomon. And after Solomon passed away, um, there was a lot of conflict over who would be the next king. So much conflict that the kingdom divided. Then we have the northern kingdom, which was called Israel, and the southern kingdom, which was called Judah, and that's where the city of Jerusalem was located. These were dark days for the people of God. During the time of the divided kingdom, the people um, did things that were deplorable in the eyes of God. Uh, There was a lot of worshiping other gods. Idolatries kind of seeped into their everyday lives. And God warned them. God tried very hard to get them um, back to where he called them to be. He, He sent people to warn them as well, prophets. And yet they continued to rebel. And eventually God allowed the land to be conquered. He lifted his hand of protection. Now the northern kingdom was conquered first by Assyria in 722 B.C., The southern kingdom lasted a little bit longer. They had some bright spots in their history. But by about 598 BC, God allowed the Babylonians to lay siege to Judah. The people, particularly the leaders, are deported into Babylon in several different waves. And Ezekiel was in one of those early waves. Now, what do we know about Ezekiel the man? Well, he was a priest He had credibility among the people, and he was kind of a weird guy. But that's okay, because Ezekiel was faithful, and he was dedicated to God in a time where it was hard to be faithful and dedicated to God. Things were really, really difficult. The people were far from home. They were separated from one another. Remember, they had not come to Babylon on their own free will. They were forced to go there. Their homeland had been crushed. Jerusalem had been thoroughly defeated. And it felt like God had abandoned them. Hopelessness had set in. So let's go back to the scripture, Ezekiel chapter 37. We find the prophet Ezekiel in this valley with all these bones. He's having a vision, and God is leading him back and forth among the bones. It's pretty eerie to me. And then God asks Ezekiel, can these bones live? Can these bones live? And I can't help but wonder what was going on in Ezekiel's mind when God asked him this. And he's like, um, hmm, I don't know. Only you know that, God. And then God tells Ezekiel to prophesy to the bones. He tells Ezekiel to tell the bones that they will come to life, that they will form, skin will cover them, and breath will fill them. And this is where you know that Ezekiel is is very obedient. He is very faithful because he doesn't question God. I think I probably would have talked back to God like, huh, you want me to to talk to these bones? But, But Ezekiel doesn't do that. He doesn't even raise an eyebrow. He simply does it. And when Ezekiel prophesies to the bones, there is a rattling sound as the bones begin to come together. I love how scripture has sound effects. It's like rattle, rattle, creak, creak, bone on bone. And the bones do come together. And there are tendons and flesh in their skin. But at this point, there isn't any real life in them. They're simply bodies of flesh and bone. I kind of picture the bodies in the human body exhibit in Mosey, maybe some of you have have visited that, where there are these cadavers, they're real bodies that have been preserved, but there's no life in them. Because to have life, there must be breath. And so God tells Ezekiel to prophesy to the bones again. 
And he tells him to say this in verse 9. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, breath, from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. Now, the Hebrew word for breath that's used here is ruach. Ruach. And in English, it means breath, spirit, and wind. So Ezekiel prophesies in God's spirit, God's breath, comes from all four directions and enters these lifeless bodies. This is the same word that's used in Genesis 2 as God breathes life into Adam. Here, God breathed life into these bodies. And then imagine this, standing before Ezekiel was a whole army, a vast army of people. No more lifeless bodies but living beings come alive with the very breath of God. And then God tells Ezekiel that these bones were the people of Israel. Remember that these are the people who were hopeless, existing but impoverished, emotionally and spiritually dead, separated from their land, separated from their God. And God tells Ezekiel to communicate to the people that God will restore them. He will put life back in them and will return them to Israel. And I love the last verse, verse 14. It says, I will put my spirit, my ruach in you and you will live. And I will settle you in your own land. And then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. And I've tried to imagine what this must have been like for the Israelites. They had been experiencing overwhelming hopelessness. And then Ezekiel brings them this message, a message of hope to people who had none. And I can imagine they might be a bit cynical. Yeah, right. I'll believe it when I see it, God. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you are there right now, that place of hopelessness, dry and parched inside, just simply a pile of dry bones, not believing that God can or will change your situation. And even as you sit in this sanctuary or worship with us online, you may feel separated from others, in exile, if you will. You may feel separated from God. I know it has been such a hard year, a hard 18 months. There have been times where I have felt quite dry and parched, where hope felt far off. It's been a hard and long season, and at times it's been quite scary. And even separate from the pandemic, life can still be really difficult. I know many of you are currently dealing with grief, and grief has a way of making us feel alone and separate from others, sometimes separate from God. I know others of you are dealing with severe anxiety. Some are dealing with relationship issues. Your marriage feels dead. You haven't spoken to your adult child in years, or maybe a friend or a child or a grandchild is dealing with with drug abuse. You're afraid. You're numb. You just feel like dry bones, like you've lost your breath. But I want to assure you, God knows the valley of dry bones within each of us, and God wants to blow into our lives. I truly believe that our God is still in the business of restoration. So I want to chat for just a moment about restoration. When we think about restoration, we typically think about restoring a house or restoring a piece of furniture, returning something back to its original state. And and that's true. That is restoration. But when I think about biblical restoration, I think about something a little different. Um, It isn't simply returning things to exactly the way they were before. Let's, Let's think about this scripture. Ezekiel gives a word of prophecy to the people. Now, it was another 40 years or so before they were actually allowed to return to Jerusalem. 
And when they did go back to Jerusalem, things weren't the same. The city was in shambles. It took a long, long time to rebuild their lives in that city. And it took hard work. And while God was present and faithful, it didn't look just as it did before. Rather, God's spirit blew and God was doing a new thing. Biblical restoration is about bringing things back to a new place, I would say a better place, improved beyond measure. Now, obviously, this is an Old Testament passage, and the message was specifically for the Israelites, God's people at the time, but I think it's impossible. It's impossible for us, it's impossible for me to read this and not connect it with the new better thing that God does through the person of Jesus Christ and the coming of the Holy Spirit. New life, resurrection, God's spirit indwelling his people. Those are themes that just kind of um, speak to me as I read this scripture from Ezekiel. You know, there are so many scriptures that, that these themes bring to mind. I think about Jesus saying in John 10.10, 10, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. It's not the same dry bones existence, um, but new, abundant life in Jesus I think about Acts chapter 2 when the early Christ followers huddled in the upper room knowing that they were waiting for something but not exactly sure what was about to happen. And then there's a loud, violent wind sound and what appear to be tongues of fire and God's spirit once again comes and indwells the people. It's different than before. It's a new thing. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, now God dwells in the people, transforming them from the inside out. God dwells in us, transforming us from the inside out. New life, a new kind of restoration. And I will say it again because I so firmly believe it, that our God is still in the business of restoration. So that's a whole lot of words to make this point. God knows your dry bones. God's spirit has the power to restore your life. God's spirit has the power to restore us as a church. But this is important. The transformative work of God is not about putting things exactly back the way they used to be. Rather, it's about allowing God's spirit to blow within us and allow God to do a new thing. You might feel right now like your marriage is dead. You might feel like there is no life left there. And I I know some of your stories, and and I know that this is something that several people at New Hope are, are dealing with. Well, I have a very good friend, and um, she had what she would have considered a dead marriage. I mean, the divorce papers had been signed. Both of them had had extramarital affairs. Um, A lot of really horrible words have been said. And yet there were people around them. The body of Christ was praying for them and pleading on their behalf. And we began to see God do a new thing. We began to see God's spirit blow in their lives and in that marriage. And over a period of time, um, we saw change. It was excruciating at times. It didn't necessarily go exactly the way they imagined it would. But let me tell you, they are together. And where God's spirit blows, there can be life In fact, I think both of them would tell you that their marriage is better than it's ever been, that God did a new thing. Maybe you're struggling with another relationship, a friend, an adult child, a sibling. I would ask you to allow God's spirit to blow in that relationship. 
Ask God, pray that God will blow in that relationship and do a new thing. It might require a lot of patience. It might require a lot of prayer and hard work. But where God's spirit blows, there can be life again. Maybe you've drifted from God. You feel dry and parched and you need to experience God's spirit, create new life in you. And then if that's you, then let's surrender that to God today. You shall live, not simply exist, but live. God also knows the dry bones in this church. So many of you have shared memories with me about the way things used to be at New Hope. When, when it seemed like this church was bursting at the seams with new believers and young families and weekly baptisms and lots of life. I can remember when Richard and I first started attending here, we led a three-year-old Sunday school class. And there were 25 kids, 25 three-year-olds in that class. It was fun and it was wild and it was full of life. And I believe there is still a lot of life here at New Hope. But the reality is things are different. But what would it look like if we, as we as a body of believers, ask God's spirit to blow powerfully through this church? What if we cried out to God and said, breathe on us, breath of God. Fill us with life anew. Transform us. Restore us. Do a new thing. I've said this many times, and I truly believe it, that that the best days of this church, the best days at New Hope are still before us. They're not behind us. But that's only if we allow the transforming work of God to do a new thing. And what is that new thing? I don't know. But I do know it's going to mean change. It will mean doing things differently. And I know that's hard. And I know that can be painful. But I also know it's necessary if we are going to live and thrive and do the work that God has called us to do as as the body of Christ. To live, not simply exist, but to truly live. We must allow the breath of God to do a new thing in all of us. So I have some questions for you, and they're really important questions. I want you to think about it and pray about these. Are you ready to ask God's spirit to restore your dry bones? Are you ready, I mean really, truly ready, to ask God's spirit to restore the dry places here at New Hope? Because where God's spirit blows, there will be life. Let's pray. Holy God, We pray for the dry bones within each of us, for the dry bones in this church. We plead with you, Lord. Blow your spirit in and through us. Blow your spirit in and through the walls of new hope. Do a new thing. Transform us. Restore us as individuals and as a body of believers so we shall live so we can do the things that you have called us to do. And we lay this at the throne of your grace. In the name of Jesus, amen.